What's going on YouTube? It's Jordan here with J-Dubs Aquatics bringing you guys a video for a brand new series I'm launching today and the series is going to be called Do's and Don'ts I want to be uh, sharing a lot of information on freshwater and saltwater do's and don'ts um, I'm not an expert I've been in the hobby for about five or six years uh, saltwater I've only done for about a year um, but I'd like to share with you things that I've learned and my opinions uh, things that have worked for me if you disagree with something I say, leave it in the comments below. Um, you know, and I'd just like to get as much feedback on this video as I possibly can uh, to let me know if I should go forward with this series or not. And um, anyway, today's topic is going to be saltwater filtration, do's and don'ts. And I'll start with uh, covering the main filter. Now, your main filter on your tank is going to be typically either a hang on back filter uh, with some people, uh, sump or a canister filter, uh, usually one of those three. Uh, I went with a canister filter in this tank. You can kind of see the lid of it down here. And I really wish I wouldn't have. Uh, a lot of people are telling me that they become nitrate factories down the road. Uh, so I am planning on upgrading to a sump pretty soon for mine. And not only that, uh, with a sump you have um, all that space underneath your tank, which is a sump is basically a tank underneath your tank, for those of you who don't know that. And um, usually the, the main tank is drilled and it has a line running down with an overflow that runs into the sump and the sump has a pump that will pump the water back up. And now before it gets to the pump it usually goes through a protein skimmer, um, filter sock, um, you know, sometimes carbon phosphate media people put in there. Um, you can put all kinds of media in there and all of your equipment that would have to usually be in your display tank can sit down in your sump which is a big plus including your heater, um, pumps for your reactors, uh, your skimmer pump if you have a hang-on skimmer, or you can actually get a, a skimmer that sits in the sump itself, which are um, they're said to be the most effective kind of protein skimmer. Now, um, another thing you can do with the sump is also set up a refugium, uh, which is a section inside of your sump to grow macroalgae, which um, in theory it outcompetes the uh, nuisance algaes in your main display tank by consuming the phosphate and nitrate uh, produced by the wastes in your tank faster than the nuisance algaes can consume them. And basically usually you have a little section with a light over top of it that the lights turned on while your display tanks light is off. And that also helps stabilize your pH and uh, slow down those pH swings that uh, you get in a tank like this without a, without a sump um, overnight. Mine will usually drop from 8.1 to 7.8 overnight and back to 8.1 the next day. And it's been that way for quite a long time. It's consistent, so I'm not too worried about it. 7.8 is pretty low for salt water. You don't want to go any lower than that, I can guarantee it. But um, anyway, so a refugium will help with that as well. And um, that leads me to the next part of filtration, protein skimmers. Uh, you don't want to go without a protein skimmer. I did it for probably the first six months and a protein skimmer is basically your first line of defense against uh, buildup of nutrients in your tank. And what a skimmer does is it mixes air with water very rapidly and organics then stick to these bubbles which are lifted up into a collection cup and the, because the organics stick to the bubbles, they uh, solid wastes, um, fish poop, um, uneaten fish foods, things like that, all eventually get removed by your protein skimmer. Uh, a majority of them will before they can even get broken down into things like phosphate and nitrate which will feed your nuisance algaes. Um, so if you set up a new tank and you don't have a skimmer, yeah you'll probably be okay for a while. I did it for quite a while in my tank but now I have rock that's leaching phosphate and nitrate because I didn't have any way to remove those things before they could break down into phosphate and nitrate. And um, so yeah, get yourself a good skimmer. Uh, it doesn't have to be too expensive. If you, if you have a 10 gallon tank, you can pick up a skimmer for $40 off Bulk Reef Supply. And that's what I have in my tank. It works pretty well uh, in my 10 gallon tank. The one I have on here is a little bit more. Uh, it was around $120, $130 for hang on back. I actually traded some fish for mine, so I didn't have to pay for it. It was used. But that's a whole other story. Um, so don't go without a skimmer. It's your first line of defense against those nutrients. 
Um, and the next topic infiltration is going to be uh, reactors. Get yourself a reactor if you don't have one, or at least, at the very least, if you have, say, a small 10 gallon tank, get yourself a small hang on filter and get some GFO, which is granular ferric oxide. It's a media that removes phosphate and silicates from your water. Um, it requires a slow upflow through the media, which is why a reactor is the best way to do it. A reactor pumps the water in down through a, t uh, a pipe slowly, and then it's forced upward through media and back out into your display um, or into your sump or wherever you have it. And um, they're very, very efficient at removing phosphates, which are going to be, uh, you know, from the food and wastes broken down in your aquarium. Um, your skimmer is not going to catch 100% of it, but it's there um, to do its job. It pulls out a lot of organics. Um, if you look in the collection cups, they get nasty, nasty black stuff in them, and that's in your tank if you don't remove it. So, um, so yeah, get a skimmer, get a reactor, uh, make sure you are also testing your water. Uh, it's very, very important. If you're not testing your water, you have no idea what's in there and uh, that can lead to all kinds of problems. So not only test your water weekly, but get yourself a good test kit. I learned the hard way there. Um, don't use a hydrometer. Get yourself at least a refractometer. Um, there uh, measures uh, salinity, and a uh, hydrometer is going to be usually off by quite a bit. I've seen quite a few different plastic hydrometers out there, and I have some friends that have them, and we've tested them up against my refractometer and they're all off by about salinity of about 0 0.03 so um, yeah so you get yourself a good test kit get yourself a good uh, refractometer for your salinity and um, some of the better test kits out there are going to be Hanna checkers or Salifert test kits uh, stay away from API test kits for especially for the uh, for the calcium and alkalinity and phosphate, um, that, that test is basically useless. You can't read the phosphates because the colors are so very slightly different. Um, it's impossible to determine what your level's actually at accurately. Uh, calcium was reading very, very low, and I might found out my calcium in my tank was actually a lot higher than it should have been. So just as an example, get yourself a good test kit and uh, don't skimp on it. It cost me a lot more in coral losses already than it would have if I would just bought myself a good test kit to start with. So, uh, next topic in this section is going to be a wave maker. Uh, wave makers are basically a computer controller for your pumps or power heads, and usually you have to get um, power heads or pumps that are compatible with wave makers, and it just creates a more random flow pattern. Mine is just the it's a cheaper version. I have a high door smart wave. If you can see it, this little unit here controls my pumps. And I have three hooked up in there, so sorry. Two of them run at once and one runs at the other time. And they alternate every five seconds in mine. So you know the, the flow is always changing and um, your fish and corals will definitely appreciate appreciate that. Don't get yourself a simple power head and just blast your fish and corals in the same direction all day. It might work for a while, but it's not long term, it's not really that good for them. Um, a simple wave maker like this was around 65 bucks. You can even find them sometimes with two uh, nice pumps for around 100 on sale. So uh, definitely get yourself a wave maker and uh, you all, your fish and corals will appreciate it. And last thing for filtration I want to talk about today is UV sterilizers and live rock. Um, I'll just get into live rock a little bit first. Your live rock is your main source of biological filtration in your saltwater aquarium. Um, you can put other types of biological filtration in, say, your canister filter, but if you have 45 pounds of live rock in your tank like I do, I could run my filter with nothing in it just for the flow. and it, you know, and a little bit of mechanical filtration and it would be doing just as good a job as it is now because the live rock I have in here um, is a surface for all of, and the live sand is all a surface for that bacteria that, that breaks down ammonia into nitrite, nitrite into nitrate. It's just all a surface for that bacteria to build up on and that com combined with uh, proper flow 
is what's going to keep your tank cycled and stable over time. Um, so it's you don't need all of that biological media to run a saltwater aquarium. Most freshwater aquariums actually are that way too, whether people realize it or not. If you have a ton of sand and stuff in your tank and rock, say, that's all going to filter your tank. But um, that's a whole other topic. UV sterilizers, uh, they're also a nice addition to uh, any aquarium, especially in a salt water, because they're going to kill free-floating free algae spores and um, bacterias and things like that. Or not bacterias, I'm sorry. Um, things like ick, uh, anything that could be free-floating past your UV sterilizer will get killed by it. So yes, if there is bacteria that pass by the UV sterilizer, they will get killed. Um, but uh, I think that's about it for the video today. Um, I've covered just about all the aspects of saltwater filtration that are commonly used, and I'd really uh, appreciate as much feedback as I can get from you guys on this video today. I'm going to try to keep these videos under five minutes in the future. Uh, this one ran a little bit long, but this was just a test run. And uh, filtration is kind of a long one anyway, so I wanted to cover as much as I could. But I'm going to get out of here for the day. Thanks for watching, and happy fish keeping.